I will come to you. I will come to you. What beautiful words. I will come to you. What is this all about? What is this morning, this service, those in person here and those at home? What are we doing here? What are we seeking to accomplish in the gathering and of worship? Why are we worshiping? Why have we gotten ready this morning when we could have easily sat at home or turned off the internet and been preoccupied and busy with other affairs? What is it that we do and seek to accomplish in these hours every Sunday as we gather? We might have different answers to that question. But fundamentally, I believe all of us, whether you've been following Jesus your entire life or are just recently seeking him, All of us are seeking God's face. All of us want something more than what we have right now of God. We want more of Him. There's something attractive and something pulling on the strings of our hearts that we want, that we are yearning for, we want more of God. I want us to turn here to Revelations chapter 2, verse 7. Here we hear about the paradise of God. This is a vision that is given to us, that is given to the churches He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, the seven churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, that is what our hearts long for, to be in the paradise of God, to be with the triune God. To finally and fully be with him. Revelations chapter 2 verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give some of the hidden manna. He who conquers, I will give you Christ myself. He who conquers and endures to the end and enters the paradise of God will receive me fully as I am. And finally, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3. This is the end of time. This is the end of the history of all that God has been doing throughout time. This is the final completion. This is the end of our hearts. This is the end of our souls. This is our place of rest. This is the goal. This is what we seek in life right now when we only get bits of it, shadows of it, glimmers of it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice calling out from the throne saying, Behold, 
the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That is what we long for. That is what we strive for. We seek to do that when we gather on Sundays is to be with God. And our hope on the fullness of this desire one day awaits us, the fullness of being in the presence and experiencing God as He fully is. Now we only get a limited version of that presence and experience. But that is our resting place when our souls will finally be at peace and we are fully restored with a new glorified body and God will be with us and we will be with God. There is no more chasm. There is no more veil. There are no more limitations. We will stand before the holy triune God fully as he is with all his splendor, majesty, and glory. That is our hope and our goal. And that is why we have gathered today be it here or at home, because we are inching our way towards that desire. To see God's face as He truly is, the Trinity, to experience the Trinity. For God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We want all of Him, not some of Him or portions of Him. We want all of Him. It's about communing with the Trinity. Heaven is primarily a relationship. Heaven is primarily a relationship. To be in communion with God fully for all time. Here, right now, that's limited. The fullness of that relationship is not possible. Sin prevents us from the fullness of that relationship. Our present form cannot function in eternity. To live is to die. We are born and we are dying as we come into this world. I gave you the image months ago of a flower taken out of a vase. That is what we are. That vase of living water is beyond us. We have been expelled, if you will. And what happens to that rose, that flower, over time? It gradually decays and withers away. Death is just a matter of time. And right now, the way that our bodies are and the way that the reality of a broken world is, we can't be in the presence of a living, holy, eternal God but one day we will. One day we will. What we have in today's gospel text is a preview. Listen to me, please. Is a preview of that Trinitarian presence and experience. It's a preview of that world that awaits us, that life that awaits us. If you read, as we just did, the language is quite basic. There's no difficult words here. But it's difficult to understand. 
I am in the Father, you will be in me, I will be in you. When you start talking about the Trinity, things get complicated pretty quick. And the Trinity is something we can't fully understand or comprehend. Even in that time when we join God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I imagine there will still be some aspects of God's divine presence that will go beyond us, that will be left a mystery. Even at that point when we are joined with him and there is no more chasm or veil, anything that separates us, sin, death, whatever. How much more now? But here the Trinity is evoked by Jesus himself. What is the context? What is the backstory? This passage that we read is on Thursday evening during his passion, before his passion. He has just had his last supper meal with his disciples. He has washed their feet. He has pointed out the betrayer, Judas, and he has told them that he is going to depart them, that he is going to leave them. And they're troubled. But he says, do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. So they're scared because later on, in just a few hours, he will be captured. He will go through some unjust trial and then eventually be sentenced to death, be crucified and die on a cross in front of thousands of people. They know what's going to take place. He's predicted this, so they're scared. And he wants to calm them down with a gift. He wants to reassure them that he, though he is leaving, is not ironically leaving. That he will give them the Holy Spirit. But there's a qualifier to receive the Holy Spirit. There's a qualifier to receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 15. If you love me, you will obey my commands. Then I will ask the Father and he will give you the helper. The Spirit of truth. This is precisely John's definition of what it means to be a Christian, right here. Those who love and obey God's commands are true believers. Verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will what? Keep my word. And my Father will love him. And he will come to him and make our home. We will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. If you love me, Jesus saying, then you will obey my commands, commandments. But it continues. Chapter 15. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. I'm not asking you to do something that I myself 
have not and will not do. If you love me, you will abide in my commandments, my commands. It continues. Verse 13, chapter 15. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Love must be displayed. And Jesus provides the model of what love looks like in actual time and space. But it continues. I want to stress this point so we get it, and there's no question, no doubt, no mistake about it, that if we say we love Jesus, and it's not a shallow, superficial love, then we have to obey his commandments. He says it time and time again. Not me. I'm just the messenger. I'm reading his words. I'm actually just reiterating and rereading what he has said to his disciples then and now. 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has nothing to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. He showed us what that love is. He demonstrated that love. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and what? Obey his commandments. This is how we know that we are children of God and that we love God is by obeying his commandments. Well, what are his commandments? That's the question. What are the things that God or Jesus commands his disciples? Love the Father, Son, and love one another. It starts with the great commandment. Love God with all your heart, your mind, soul, and strength? Yes. But then there is love your neighbor as yourself. If we do such, if we obey these two commandments, they sum up all the law and the prophets in the Old Testament and all of the teachings of Christ. This is the Torah of Christ. This is the law of Christ to love God and to love one another as I have loved you. If you do you will receive my Father's Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Two key words here that we cannot just quickly read and glance over. Here Jesus is interceding on on our behalf. I will ask the Father. He, without us asking, is going to ask the Father to give us the helper. He goes out of his way. He's thinking about us before we actually approach and petition him. This kind of reminds me of my dad. My dad would often just visit people. He would just have a phone call, make a phone call, a a cold phone call, and just check up on people. Go to the local pharmacist or the mechanic or his friend that has retired. He would just show up unannounced and just to check in and see how they were doing. And often he would come with gifts, pastries. That was my father. And for the longest time, that kind of bothered me. I would say, Dad, you go out of your way. You make those phone calls. You drive there, sometimes far, on your day off. Why do you do it? These people maybe will just take advantage of you. In my mind, It's almost like he was a fool for doing such things because it wasn't reciprocal. 
not that I knew. They wouldn't come out of their way on their day off to talk to someone who is no real benefit to them. It's not like my father could give them something beyond pastries. God, I, father, dad, I would say, well, they lose respect in you. You're just kind of coming and going. My dad would say, that's just who I am. I initiate. I don't wait. That's just how I'm wired. Jesus. Jesus doesn't wait for us to ask. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will send the Helper. The Trinity is here. The paraclete. The Greek word here is paralektos. Paralektos. The paraclete. Not parakeet. The paraketos. Kaletos is a verb form of the word kaleo, which means to call. Para means to be alongside. So somebody to call alongside. It's very simple. Paracletos, paraclete. Someone called alongside. I will send someone to come alongside you. For what? For everything and anything. I will call the helper, the paraclete. He will come alongside of you. And you can ask of him anything to teach you, to counsel you, to heal you, to be with you, to direct you, to nourish you, to strengthen you, to guide you, to love you. Anything and everything we want that is in the will and heart of God, the paraclete, the helper, the advocate, will come and do. And that's what an advocate is, a helper. We think of that word advocate in legal terms or political terms. Somebody who has no voice. That word is used, advocate, paraclete, five times in the New Testament, one about Jesus, and four times about the Holy Spirit. He will come and advocate. He will be with us. He will help us. Another word, the word another. Another helper. So he's saying that I'm a helper, but I'm going to send another helper. Another helper. Another one who will come alongside of you, just as I've been alongside of you for the past three years of your life, disciples. This is why the Greek matters. Because in the Greek, there's two words for another. In English, we only have one word, another. In Greek, you have two words. Heritas is the first Greek word. Heritas is, means another, but another of a different kind. Okay? That's the first word that we get in the Greek language for another. Another, but of a different kind. This is where we get the word heterodox. Different. In Galatians chapter 1, that we just did a Bible study. If anyone preaches to you heterotos, another gospel, something different from the one I preach to you, the Apostle Paul says, let them be accursed. But that's not the word that Jesus uses here. He uses the second word in Greek for another. And that word is Alas. Alas? It means another of the exact same kind. You see, Jesus, what he did there? I'm going to send you another helper of the very same kind. In other words, I, though I leave you, 
he will come in my place and help you just as I have helped you. That's why you will, no lo- you will not be an orphan because even though I'm going, I'm not really going. Even though I depart, I'm not really departing from your presence. I will send you a helper exactly like the helper I am. And that's why in verse chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says, it is to your advantage that I leave. Because if I don't leave, then the other helper, the paraclete, will not come to you. And think about it. Jesus is fixed and limited to one place in time in history. He can only reach so many people in his life as a man. But here's the great benefit and the wonderful gift from God is that as he will ascend to the Father and the Holy Spirit will come down to those who love and obey his commands, he will be with all people for all time. His streets and... His reach and his scope will go beyond anything Jesus could have done in his earthly ministry. And that's why Jesus is here right now. Jesus is in Buenos Aires, Argentina right now. Jesus is in Moscow, Russia right now. Jesus is in Paris, France right now. He's in Manchester, England right now. He's in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio right now. He's in Montreal, Canada right now. He's in Sydney, Australia right now. He is in Yerevan, Armenia right now. Jesus is everywhere. He's in Nigeria, Africa right now. He's in Brazil right now. That's the scope and the reach and the advantage and the benefit of the Holy Spirit coming down on earth for us. He is with us now. We have full access. We don't lose anything that the disciples had in their day. Just because we don't see him doesn't mean he, the person, the Holy Spirit, which he is and not an it, he is with us as Jesus was with the disciples. But here's the thing about the Holy Spirit And these are the words I get from J.I. Packer, the late, great Anglican. He describes the Holy Spirit as shy. The Holy Spirit is shy. Shy in what way? Not that he doesn't have power or ability, but he will not forge his way upon us if we don't call upon him. And that's what we need to do. He is with us always, Jesus says. And Jesus gives the Holy Spirit another word. The Spirit of truth. Of course. How could he not be the Spirit of truth? He is God, the third person. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. The same Spirit. And he says that he dwells with you and will be with you. He dwells with you right now in my presence. Me being with you, the Holy Spirit is with you. Because remember, Jesus, three years of ministry, the Holy Spirit was with them. He was with Mary in the womb. From beginning, the Holy Spirit was with Jesus. Jesus being with the disciples is equal to the Holy Spirit being with the disciples, but he also speaks in the future tense, he will be in you. He will come to you on the day of Pentecost, he is saying on that day, he will come in you. He will come inside of you and rock and change and radically alter your life. Boom! He will come. Jesus was not lying, is not lying. This is his promise to us. 
He will be what I am. I will never forsake you, Matthew 28. I will never leave you. The Apostle Paul, St. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Well, how does Christ live in me? I would ask the question to St. Paul, well, what do you mean that Christ lives in you? With the person of the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in me, he would say. In that day, on the day of Pentecost, he says the world does not know him or see him. Remember, they said to Jesus when he performed all those miracles, remember what they said about him? The power and the spirit working in him is of the devil. The world does not receive or see or know the Holy Spirit because it does not acknowledge the power by which he is, the person by which he is. We have to acknowledge Christ as Lord to receive the Holy Spirit. The world is preoccupied with materialism and not in tune with the Spirit and truth of God. That's why they don't see him. They didn't see Jesus in that day. They didn't accept him as who he was and his claims. But Jesus said, do not worry, you will be put in synagogues before rulers, before kings, and he will testify about me. So do not be troubled. I am with you always. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is, it is he who loves me. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Simon Peter, do you love me? Of course I do. Feed my sheep. Simon Peter, do you love me? Tend my sheep. Simon Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Love is displayed in action. If we love as God, Christ has called us to love both the Father and one another. We will receive the Holy Spirit who will come alongside of us and guide us and help us and comfort us and heal us. We have access now. This is a preview of the world that awaits us in the future. So wherever you and I find ourselves this morning, Do not shortchange yourself from the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is with you always. Always is a long time. Always is a long time. And I end with this. What is God saying to you this morning? Are these words going to roll off our ears? Or is God real to you and to me and will we not only hear these words but believe them I was here for about three hours last night and I asked God Give your people your spirit. That is the greatest gift we could receive. When people are hurting, 
often, even as a priest, I don't know what to say to them. But you know what I do say? May the Holy Spirit be with you. He knows more than I do. He can do more than I can do. May the Holy Spirit be with you and me. Lord, come.